Praise the Lord. I'm so glad you've taken the time to join me today. Uh, I want to have a conversation with you concerning a very sensitive subject. There are many of you who have uh, had some high impact moments, not only during these past 12 months, but throughout your lifetime. Uh, especially those of you who have lost a spouse, commonly known as a widow or widower, depending on whether you're male or female. I want to talk to you about that today. Uh, what the Word of God says, His perspective on your circumstance and your situation. For those of you who never joined us before, I'm Bishop David Evans, and I thank you for giving us the honor of sharing what I believe will be some wisdom, not only for you if it's your situation, but some wisdom you can share with someone that you know who's perhaps been thrust into widowhood uh, and are not quite sure what the next steps are, what God is doing, why God allowed it, uh, all those questions that are felt uh, more than asked. I want to answer the, some of the questions you've been feeling today about your situation as a widow or widower. All right, now let's go to the Word of God. Uh, and while you're going there, when you get a moment, why don't you tag at least five people and uh, invite them to join us today as we uh, talk about something that's sensitive, but I believe it's relevant. Uh, we live in a time, because of the pandemic, we live in a time of what I call complex trauma. Uh, very few people have the favor of dealing with one major issue at a time before the pandemic. And now with the pandemic, uh, has caused not only external challenges, but internal challenges, if I may say it that way. We've got some emotional challenges going on. We've got circumstantial challenges going on. Vocational and business challenges have arisen. Uh, we're finding people that have emotional issues that are becoming more prominent because of the pandemic and the requirements for trying to stay safe. And then you've got people who have just given up and decided, well, if I catch it, I catch it, which is not wisdom. There are some things in your life God does not want you to experience. And the, the fallback, the answer to that is that, you know, whatever happens, happens. No, that's not the type of life God has for you. Uh, coincidence, happenstance, luck, just happen to happen. That's not how God operates. He is definitive. He is specific. He is focused about your life and about my life. So let's take a look at the Bible as we talk about uh, this, this widowhood for a second. Um, go to 1 Kings chapter 17, and we'll go down to verse 10 and start there, and then we'll go to 2 Kings 4, read a couple of scriptures, and then we'll start a conversation around these two texts and specifically focused on the subject today. So 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning at verse 10. So he arose, talking about Elijah the prophet, went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she was going to fetch it. He called as she was going to fetch it. He called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord thy God lives. I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise or a jar. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go and in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. Elijah said unto her, fear not, go and do as you have said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Watch the detail and bring it unto me. And after make one, make for thee and for thy son. For thus he said, for thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, the barrel of meal, if you follow the instructions, shall not waste. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did According to the saying of Elijah, she and he and he in her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail 
according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. There are a few things in the text that we want to observe. We'll shift to 2 Kings 4, and that will add the rest of this thought, complete the thought for today. So we find this individual who obviously was married, has a child, is now single parenting, and facing some very difficult, challenging economic and social circumstances. She appears to have no visible means of support. That is the biblical definition of a widow, not appearing to have a visible means of support impacted both economically and socially because it appears as though she has no friends to assist her, probably because they're all going through the same famine. Her son, evidently, is not old enough. They don't. They mention his existence, so we're not sure whether he's gathering with her or not. But the implication is that she's having this one-on-one -on -one with the representative from God. God is sending her a word for her situation. God is sending her a word for her situation. So this is what I want to suggest to you. If you are a widower, a person who uh, was married, if you're a person who was in a long-term relationship that was endeared to your heart, but I'm talking specifically now about those people who absolutely were married formally, and through death, there is a separation of the two. The Bible is clear today in the text. She appears to be on her own. She's gathering sticks. She's given up on life for her and her child. The man of God comes with the word that is in season for her. Number one, it shows you that God has not forgotten you. Number two, it shows you that when God shows up, he has a solution to the problem. Number three, we must realize that when God shows up in our situations, he's trying to reignite our faith and trying to give you direction, renew or establish the promise of God in your life. That sustaining, keeping caring, loving relationship that he has with you. And that even though she says to the man of God, we're going to eat this bread and die, he says, you still have a future. Your future is not over. I know what your plans are, but God has other plans for you. Amazing text. You notice she begins to reply to him in a very common but in a way that um, she does not fully recognize that God is sending deliverance to her in the midst of her pain. So the man of God calls to her, tells her, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water. Bring me some water. Now they're in a, in a drought that the man of God has called himself. So they're in this drought and he comes there and says, fetch me some water because he's aware that they're at the edge of the city. They're at the well. And as she's going to fetch the water, he says, he has one more thing. Now, man, imagine this. This is how God works. He, he, he will demand or command us to do things that we believe are at the limits of our ability to comply. So he says, bring me some water. She obeys because she recognizes this is the man of God. This is the anointing that God has sent to encourage me in this time. So out of reverence for who he is, she starts to turn to go get the water because the water is still available. As she's going, he adds to the demand. I need you to see this. She's already decided she dies today. He says, I want to see how much of your heart is actually left for God. Bring me this water. As she's going, he adds another. So the first request is a challenge, but not necessarily tapping into her personal need. Watch the next one now. But the second one, he says, and bring me 
I pray thee, a morsel of bread. Watch the details in your hand. Bring me the bread in your hand. Now, her situation, her circumstance, her crisis, the crisis state of her heart begins to speak. She says, I don't have a cake. And I believe she probably said it with a little attitude. I don't have a darn cake. But I do have a handful of meal in a barrel and a little bit of oil in a jar. And you need to understand I'm gathering this now to go home and bake it for my son and myself so we can eat this as a last meal, a last supper and die. Wow. He says to her, don't fear. Fear is often the enemy of our faith. Fear, watch this now, will attract the words to legitimize itself. That's why when she was post when she was posed with the question of the cake, she responded with her circumstance. This is very, very important for us. We must be careful how when God is moving in our lives, that we respond in faith and not the language of our crisis. Because what is God is attempting to do is shift her and you and I past the language of crisis to the behavior and the language of obedience. Elijah said unto her, fear not, go and do as thou hast said. Go ahead and make your cake. I just want to change what you're going to do just a little. He says, make me. A little cake first and bring it to me. Watch deliverance is now presented, but there is importance in the details. He says, make me a little. I don't want the whole thing. I want a part of what you're going to make. I don't want you to make a cake and cut me a slice. I don't want you to make a cake and break me off a piece. What I want you to do is make one dedicated to bringing it to the Lord, put it in my hand, and then go make one for you and your son. Now, there's a revelation in the text. He tells them, tells her, go make me a cake first and bring it to me. This is really the first miracle. The first miracle is her obedience in the situation that she's in. The second miracle is that the man of God has given her an instruction which will uh, allow her to obey, but she will still have enough for what she believes she uses, needs it for. That is for her and her son. He says then, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, if you do this thing, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. In other words, this meal and this, bar this barrel of meal and this jar of oil will supply your daily bread until this period of famine has ended, until the rain comes again. And the Bible says she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. This is important. She did not change the commandment by disobeying it. She did not doubt the truth of the commandment by altering it. She began to operate, watch this now, in the instruction in spite of the circumstance. This widow now is coming to a revelation of God that despite her previous belief, just moments later, she is allowing the word of God to give her a different perspective, not only on God's provision, but her son's life and her own life. Because you need to understand, in the text, the worst thing that could happen to a lady was to become a widow and have no son. But now the situation is threatening the son. Son is a symbol of future. Who will take care of her? Watch how this works now. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. She and he and her house. Wait a minute. She and he and her house. Second definition for widow. 
a palace, if you will, in disrepair. So some of her people, some of her servants, those in her circle, were still with her. So she ate, her son ate, and those who worked in the house with her for many days. So you've seen someone without any apparent means of support whose economic situation has changed, but there are still vestiges or evidences of a life well lived at one time. And the Bible says, according to the word of God, verse 16, and the barrel of meal wasted not, meaning it did not run out. Now, what that means is the, the, the amount in the barrel did not necessarily change. The amount in the jug of oil didn't necessarily change. So the levels didn't change. But every time it was used, it was replenished. So I don't want you to get a sense of the barrel filled up to the brim with, with meal and the oil jar filled up with oil. No. Every time she used it, every time she dipped in by faith, what was needed was there. This is amazing to me. What was needed was there. I'm trying to help your faith during this time of trial. The barrel didn't waste it not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord. Watch why this happened. This miracle was perpetuated because in her sorrow, in her circumstance, Listen to me, man or woman of God. She obeyed the Lord. And it's going to be a little different. My phone's ringing because I'm waiting for somebody to call me. I don't know who that is. Houston train. Okay. Um, so watch this now. So, so uh, because of obedience... Because she did not change the instruction. Now, on this, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to Second Kings, but I need to tell you something. God did not change what He said to her, and she had enough faith not to change what she believed, and because of that, she followed the instruction, and a miracle was released in her life. All right, let's go to 2 Kings 4. Let me show you something. 2 Kings 4. Verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? What do you have in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house except, or the Bible says, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon you and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out unto all these vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. What's the difference in the So she went from him, shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out. And when it came to pass, the vessels were full. that she said unto her sons, bring me yet another a vessel. Bring me another one. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil ceased or stayed. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil, pay the debt. And live thou and thy children off the rest. Mm. We are living in a time when there are just too many people who have spouses die and they are left in uh, very trying economic circumstances. Uh, the house is still there, children are still there, needs are still there. But once again, there's no visible means of support and the future seems to be threatened by the circumstance. That the future that she had planned for her children, it appears as though that future is about to be hijacked because of some economic commitments that the spouse had. And it appears as though that these economic commitments are going to disrupt all their lives. Her future, her son's, her son's future, and hers. So what are we looking at here?
the Lord tells her to do something uh, through the man of God, through the word of God, that is kind of counterintuitive. It's not what you would do if you were already in credit problems, you had credit problems, already in debt. He tells her to do what I think naturally we would want to do. Go borrow vessels. Now, this is amazing. He doesn't tell her to go to a bank. Tell her to go to her neighbors, watch this, to borrow something she can return. To borrow something they all will have on hand. So the use of the vessels is not the issue where she gets them from. That she follows the instruction, which may be counterintuitive to how she's feeling and what her circumstances represent. So here we come in the text now. He says to her, what do you want me to do for you? In other words, speaking for the Lord, what do you desire? Now, you need to have the ability to express to God your petition in, with clarity. So you'll know what to have faith in and he'll know what to respond to. He says, what do you have in the house? Watch this. She says, all I have is a little oil. Underestimating the powerful, necessary thing she has to secure the future. All I have is some oil. All I have is the anointing that God gave me. All I have are the promises that God gave me. All I have is the empowerment that the Lord gave to me. All I have is a little, watch how she speaks of it, a little oil in the house, meaning this oil does not seem to be enough to take care of the issues we're facing. Then he tells her to do the counterintuitive thing, go borrow vessels from your neighbors. And obviously um, she went and had, the, you know, she did that. He says, and when you get back home, close the door, because this is a personal miracle for you and your sons. When you get back home, I want you to do something strategic. I want you to start pouring the oil that's left into the vessels that are empty. This act of faith in private begins a process of provision from God. Watch this. Here's the promise. Not only to handle the oil, quote unquote, shortage in the house, but eliminate the problem that being a widow has presented her. This blows my mind. So watch how God tests us. What he, if you don't remember another thing I say today, remember this. The Lord will always test you with a thing that looks unrelated to the solution that you need. He will test you with a thing that looks unrelated to the solution that you and he knows that you need. So she did what she was asked to do. This is so important. This is so important. During critical times, the accuracy of your response and your behavior relating to the word of God is critical. I don't want you to make a Saul mistake and decide which part of God's will you're going to obey. You're in a critical situation, both emotionally, sometimes spiritually, circumstantially, economically. I don't want you to make a mistake and decide which part of God's will you're going to make doable. Now watch what happens. Divine opportunity has visited you just like it's visited this woman. Let me show you how a season looks. A real season is not a gift wrap package dropped on your front step without any, any labor on your part. Grace is free. Favor is gained. Watch what she does. She, be, she obeys in the midst of her circumstances. Watch how this works now. Not only does she obey, but she, she pays close attention to the details. Everything the word tells her to do, he does. Because there is a miracle attached to this obedience. So she goes up. She got the vessels from her neighbors. And she began to pour out. And the miracle began to happen 
in her action. I'm trying to share with you today that there is a breakthrough for every widow and widower that is listening to me right now. And that breakthrough is attached to your obedience to God. And he's going to ask you to do something that does not seem, make sense in the natural, but makes perfect supernatural sense. There's a miracle attached to our obedience in the midst of circumstances that seem to defy the word of God. The vessels were full, the Bible says. And she had to make sure she told her son, bring me another one. He said, there is no more. And the miracle stayed. Watch this. Here comes the solution. She came and told the man of God, got another instruction. Go sell the oil. Pay your debts. Live thou and thy children on the rest. Use what I'm giving you. Pay off your debts. Don't go buy a flat screen. Don't go out and go to dinner. Pay your debts. And then live on the rest. So he sets up care, provision for widows. Don't miss your season. Don't miss your opportunity. A season from God has been provided to her. First thing you want to remember about a season is divine opportunity is often inconvenient. She had to overcome some pride to go ask her neighbors for these vessels. I believe the instruction was to, was to break any pride she had that would block her from receiving this miracle. Secondarily, it was an inconvenience. Those who miss God usually resent the intrusion on their normal. So if you're a widow or widower today, I want to encourage you. This word is for you. God has a word for you. And you're in a critical season in your life where you cannot afford to decide what you're going to obey, what you're not going to obey. I'm simply telling you to have faith in God. Trust God. And he'll see you through. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak into a very sensitive area of your life. I'm Bishop Dave G. Evans, and I'll see you real soon.